Hi, my name is Rick Sheffer, and welcome to my presentation on iron furnaces of Venango and Clarion counties. One of my dad's hobbies was searching out and researching old iron furnaces that dotted the countryside of western Pennsylvania. These iron furnaces were in use between 1820 and 1860, after which time they become unprofitable to use. On an occasional Sunday, Dad would take my brother Tom, me, and Granddad and head off to the woods in search of one of these forest-enveloped stone towers. Many of the black and white photos of old furnaces shown in this document were taken by Dad with his Kodak Taurus II medium format camera. Dad was the source of my interest in Iron Furnace and my inspiration for preparing this presentation. I hope you enjoy it. There was a 30-year span in the history of Venango County and Clarion County when iron was its chief industry. Both counties contributed to the growth of Pittsburgh as the demand for iron resources grew and the city became center for the iron and steel industry. In 1824, the Mineralogical Association of Western Pennsylvania, a privately financed group, began to search out possible sources of iron in the region. The group's report was favorable, saying that Venango and Clarion County's hills abound with iron ore and limestone of excellent quality. The amount of capital necessary for the construction of a furnace and supporting facilities ranged between $15,000 and $20,000. Under the county's financial situation in the 1820s, this was a large sum of money, and it required cooperative financing to raise the necessary capital. The first furnace built and operated in the two counties was erected in 1824 by John Anderson on Big Scrubgrass Creek near the present day of Kennerdale. It was called the Anderson Furnace, and the first iron furnace in Clarion County was built in 1828 by Christian Myers on Little Toby Creek, and it was called the Clarion Furnace. Men of capital rushed into the district and built the picturesque smelting furnaces for converting iron ore into pig iron. The 26 furnaces were erected in Venango County, and 30-some furnaces were built in Clarion County. The furnaces all got their supplies by river from Pittsburgh and were then distributed throughout the region. Emmeton was a regional supply center in a river port. A new era of prosperity opened up in the region, giving employment to a little army of workers and adding materially to the area economies. Almost all furnaces were built beside hills, having flat areas at the level of the furnace tops. Materials were taken to these benches for charging into the furnace. Bridges between the tops of the stacks and the benches were used for this purpose. Another location requirement was the availability of water power to turn a wheel that worked the bellows. The blast of the air from the bellows charged the fire hot enough to melt the iron from the ore. Bellows used in early furnaces were made of wood and leather and looked like bellows used to start fires in our fireplaces today, or it consisted of two pistons moving alternately through two wooden tubs. The furnace bellows was quite large, some of them 12 feet long and 4 feet wide, 4 feet deep. Because of their comparative isolation, each furnace had a small economic complex of its own. A company store, blacksmith shop, workers home, stables, and other shops necessary for early 19th century living, such as sawmilling, storekeeping, grist milling, and the carding of wool. Although actual operations of the blast furnace probably required 15 to 20 men around the clock, other jobs connected directly with the furnace. These included cutting wood and making charcoal, hauling the charcoal, raising food for the employees and the horses, hauling ore, limestone, and pig iron. These duties increased the number of workers to between 60 and 80. 
The wages ranged from $30 to $26 per month, which was good compensation for those days. Of this, a quarter to a half was payable in cash, the balance in orders on the operator's store. In addition to workers, from 30 to 50 horses were needed for the many hauling jobs at the site. Hardwood converted into charcoal was a critical ingredient in the making of iron. Charcoal was usually made near the furnace and coaling pits, which involved an intricate process that conditioned how fast the fire would burn. Because the jolting transportation would have reduced the charcoal to useless powder, the bulky cordwood was brought to the furnace to be transformed into charcoal. Each furnace required approximately 150 acres of hardwood trees cut each year and turned into charcoal in order to feed the furnace beast. Furnaces were either circular or square in design and between 25 and 30 feet high. This was referred to as the stack and it was constructed in three layers. The inside wall was refractory brick built to withstand the tremendous heat. The next layer of sand or clay served as insulation and the outer wall was made of dressed stone or flat field stone. The inner wall of the furnace was shaped like an egg and opened at both ends. This area of the furnace was called the Bosch and it acted as the fire chamber. Venango and Clarion Bosches were usually eight feet in diameter. The fillers or loaders alternately dumped layers of iron ore limestone and charcoal into the Bosch through the tunnel at the head of the furnace. Two tons of local ore, one or two tons of charcoal, and a few shovelfuls of limestone would produce about one ton of pig iron. The charcoal served as fuel and the limestone was added to remove the impurities from the iron ore, acting as a flux. The charcoal fire in the Bosch was superheated to over 2300 degrees Fahrenheit due to blasts of cold air that were forced into the chamber by the bellows. At this temperature, the iron ore over time became molten and reduced to pig iron. The limestone acted as a flux that lifted the lighter impurities in the mix to the surface of the iron in the form of slag, where the iron master drew off the slag with a rake for discarding. The whole process was continuous, with the charge never being allowed to cool during the blast. While the iron was collecting in the hearth, the molder and his apprentices were busy in an adjacent building known as the mold house. Here, sand molds were being prepared to receive the flowing iron. One long sand mold was shaped to channel the iron from the furnace. The longer mold was called the sow. At right angles to the sow was a series of shorter molds known as pigs. When the damp stone was removed from the Bosch, the iron ran into the pig sand molds to become pig iron. At the end of the run, the pigs were broken from the sow and taken to the founder for grading. The founder would split a typical cast and grade it according to the grain, color, and smell. The grading scale was 1, 2, 2x, 3, and 3x. The higher the number, the greater the impurities. Most of Venango and Clarion County iron was a 2 or a 3. The slag shown here I actually picked out of a stream next to one of the old furnaces that we had located. Early iron manufacturers operated their furnaces only 6 to 9 months each year. The remaining time was spent cutting lumber for charcoal and making repairs to the furnace and equipment. Some of the iron produced locally was marketed locally to area foundries where stoves, kettles, skillets, and plows were manufactured. Blacksmith shops and trip forges also purchased the iron and converted it into nails, wagon wheels, horseshoes, and a variety of other useful domestic products. Prior to 1828, river shipments were made on flatboats during the spring and fall to Pittsburgh, 
Regular steamboat service began in 1830, although flatboats continued to be used. Pittsburgh was the base of supplies, for the iron received consignments of goods by steamboat, and Hamilton became an important port on the river. Several steamboats were generally uploading supplies for the furnace operators, or loading pig iron for the return trip to Pittsburgh. In the course of a few days, the warehouse would be filled and the adjoining streets piled up high with hogshead, cask, barrels, and boxes. The warehouse proprietor acted as a forwarding agent, and the freight was shipped to the furnaces in ponderous wagons, drawn usually by mules. During the summer months, the town was quiet, giving the merchants an opportunity to reduce their stocks and prepare for the next shipment of goods, while the furnace proprietors attended to the manufacture of pig iron. Probably the most complete original furnace left in Venango County is the Rockland Furnace. Still standing is a good square stack, a good mill race and wheel pit, and a nice waterfall along Shoals Run in Rockland Township. A beautiful example of the classic square stack furnace is Helen Furnace in Highland Township in Clarion County. It has been rebuilt so it is in perfect condition. It was in operation from 1845 to 1857 and within a 26 week period produced a thousand tons of iron. The stack is 32 feet high with an 8 foot Bosch. Both furnaces are a treat to visit. The Venango and Clarion County iron industries commenced operating around 1820 and died out around 1860 when it became uneconomical to process Pennsylvania bog ore. The primary causes of the decline of the iron industry in the area were due to one, the increased cost of hauling iron ore, two, depletion of nearby timber, and three, completion by large coke and anthracite stacks elsewhere in Pennsylvania. The Western Pennsylvania iron industry was a powerful contributor to the health of the area and growth of the iron and steel industry. The bones of many of these grand stone towers still exist but have been taken over by time and the forest. I still remember those wonderful trips into the wilds with my dad, searching out these stone monuments of days gone by. Thank you for your interest in my presentation today. If you are still a lover of the Venango and Clarion County histories after viewing this presentation, you might enjoy my presentation on the early Pennsylvania oil industry which has had over 13,000 views on YouTube. This video and others I've created are available to view on my YouTube channel. All you have to do is Google Rick Sheffer YouTube channel. And again, thank you for your time and interest today.